Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us here at the Center for Global Development this morning for this very, very important event on the Rohingya crisis uh, in Burma and Bangladesh. Uh, the, a lot of attention in the U.S. right now is being focused understandably on a series of historic hurricanes in Texas, Florida, and Puerto Rico. As those have been going on over the past few weeks, uh, a, a crisis that is just as devastating, uh, perhaps uh, substantially more devastating, has been playing out on the other side of the world as half a million Rohingya uh, Muslims have fled uh, Burma into Bangladesh uh, under force of violence from the, the Burmese military. Uh, the event today will explore the backdrop to this. Uh, we'll talk about what we know about what is happening in Burma and about the conditions in Bangladesh, the humanitarian needs there, and the way forward for policymakers and humanitarian responders on this crisis. We're joined by uh, an excellent, excellent panel. Um, First, we will hear remarks from Eric Schwartz, the president of Refugees International and a former senior official in both the UN and US government systems. Uh, then we will bring up a, um, a discussion panel of Andrea Gittleman from the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, Sarah Margon from Human Rights Watch, and Jason Mills from Doctors Without Borders. So without further ado, I want to turn it over to Eric, who has just returned from a trip to the region and will set some opening remarks and uh, tell us about what he saw. Eric? Good morning, everybody. I just got back from six years in Minnesota, and when you say that in Minnesota, everyone responds and says, good morning. But this is Washington. Things don't work that way. Um, thank you, Jeremy, uh, for uh, hosting, and thanks to the Center for Global Development for hosting this important conversation um, on this, this situation of the Rohingya uh, from Burma. Like, like so many of our counterpart organizations in the human rights and humanitarian uh, community, uh, we at Refugees International uh, quickly learned of the magnitude of this really horrific crisis. Uh, and in fact, information on the extent of abuses uh, was, was not extremely hard to come by, uh, notwithstanding the restrictions on, Rakhine, uh, on access to Rakhine State uh, in Burma. On August 28, as the Burmese military was driving out tens of thousands of the minority Rohingya Muslim population uh, from Burma to Bangladesh, uh, we condemned shocking violations of human rights. And by September 5th of um, uh, this month, after more than 100,000 Rohingya had been forced from their homes and hundreds, if not more, reportedly killed, uh, we called for sanctions against the Burmese government and stated, and I quote, uh, make no mistake, ethnic cleansing and crimes against humanity are taking place in the full view of the international community. Now, by, by asserting on September 5th that crimes against humanity were taking place, uh, we were prepared to defend the proposition that, atrocity, that atrocities were being committed uh, and if I may use the language of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, as part of a widespread or sy systematic attack directed against any civilian population and with knowledge of the attack. Now, I note the timing of, of our statement not to suggest that we were more prescient than others, but because it does stand in some contrast with the time it has taken for official institutions with far greater capacity than Refugees International, the United States government, for instance, uh, to get to a similar point. And I, I want to get back to that in a few minutes because I think it's important. We also decided we needed to go to the field 
as quickly as possible to bear witness. And while we are still waiting for a response from the government of Burma, the government of Bangladesh uh, um, was eager to have us visit. And I traveled there with um, my colleague, our senior advocate for human rights, Dan Sullivan, who's with us today and is a lot smarter on these issues than I am. And, um, and we traveled to Bangladesh uh, earlier this month. Uh, we returned last week. We were in Dhaka and then Cox's Bazaar from, and of course, Point South from September 15th uh, to September 19th. And we traveled to four makeshift camps uh, for uh, newly arrived Rohingya refugees, uh, Balukali, uh, Kutu Palang, Tyne Kelly, and Unchi Prong camps, makeshift camps, which together were probably at the time holding uh, between 100 and 200,000 of the new arrivals. Uh, we also visited a hospital for serious cases uh, in Cox's Bazaar. Um, now, conditions in the region south of Cox's Bazaar along the border with Burma are particularly difficult. Of all the countries, and if some of you are uh, demography experts, you may correct me, but I think of all the countries in the world with populations of more than 10 million people, uh, Bangladesh may be the most densely populated country. Uh, and in the region south of Cox's Bazaar, near the border with Burma, people were everywhere. Uh, as the now, now 500,000, when we were there, the number was 400,000, new arrivals have come on top of several hundred thousand other Rohingya refugees who had been forced out of Burma in recent years. The region is still in its rainy season, and with makeshift shelters on hillsides and in every available um, unused space, mud and muck is just about everywhere. Uh, we'll play a very short video taken at the border that gives you 30 seconds, which gives you a sense of the challenge and, um, and I think which you can appreciate if you look not at me, but the people behind me. I'm not supposed to push a button, am I? At the border between Burma and Bangladesh, uh, in front of an area that they're calling here no man's land, between the two borders, uh, of course, some 400,000 uh, other Rohingya have recently arrived in Bangladesh and the situation and circumstances that they, that they confronted really uh, were unspeakable. Crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing, and terrible abuses uh, that the world should know about. Now the, the pain and the trauma that, that Dan and I witnessed, of course, I don't think was was primarily the result of the the physical circumstances, as as difficult as as they clearly are, uh, but rather I think the result of unimaginable uh, emotional and psychological pain and and suffering that's being experienced. Uh, and in the remarks, let me confess that in the remarks that follow, I'm going to draw from uh, uh, some blogs that I've written. Uh, over the past couple of weeks, uh, which really express the sentiments that I'd like to convey this morning. First, let me mention uh, at the outset that over a three-decade career, um, uh, I've been on dozens of these kinds of, of missions. I, I just can't remember uh, choking up on any of them uh, until this trip. At a hospital in Cox's Bazaar, Dan and I saw a young, <clears throat> young girls and boys ages 1 to 17 who had themselves suffered horrible gunshot wounds inflicted by the military, the Burmese military, burns and other physical and emotional abuse and psychological trauma that, um, that one could only imagine. We spoke to their parents and witnessed their their overwhelming sadness at not being able not being able to protect their kids from such terrible violence. Um, I just can't get with I just can't get out of my get out of my mind. First, the image of a mother in despair telling me that her 17 year old daughter had been tied up by several Burmese military, 
and not really mentioning further details other than the fact that the young girl was now experiencing severe pains in her stomach area, a clear signal of sexual exploitation and abuse. Um, and second, the image of the young girl lying on a cot with such a vacant look uh, in her eyes. And the stories we heard from Rohingya refugees in the camps, one after the other, of the military arriving unannounced in villages, launching incendiary devices of some kind, and then shooting at villagers as they fled. Interviewee after interviewee telling Dan and me that a son, a spouse, or another relative uh, had been killed uh, in the attempt to flee. Now, having been witness to too many man-made tragedies over the course of a career in human rights and humanitarianism, I, I hope I've learned uh, to scan the horizon every day uh, for those events that are of such magnitude um, that, they, that they require an unrelenting sounding of the alarm. To put it another way, if you're, if you're doing work in this field, you need to be continually aware that 10 years hence, you may have to answer the question, did I do everything, did you do everything possible, everything you should have done to try to help avert or end a tragedy of historic proportion. Uh, Samantha Power uh, wrote eloquently about how policymakers must grapple with this question. First, in 2001, in, a, in an Atlantic piece on the Rwandan genocide entitled Bystanders to Genocide, and then in her seminal work, A Problem from Hell, America in the Age of Genocide. One quotation from an interview with um, my former colleague, Susan Rice, conducted by Samantha, who was also my former colleague, um, has stayed with me for many years. Uh, Susan, who was at the NSC during the Rwandan genocide, later reflected on her role. And she said to Samantha, and I quote, I swore to myself that if I ever face such a crisis again, I would come down on the side of dramatic action, going down in flames if that was required. The Department of State's Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, uh, Prue uh, Bushnell, reflecting on her own role in Rwanda at the time, said, and I quote, maybe the only way to draw attention to this was to run naked through the building, the State Department. I'm not sure anyone would have noticed, but I wish I had tried. If I can use Susan's phrase, um, each of us who is engaged in human rights and humanitarianism um, should think about going down in flames at moments like this one. We must do so because we're indeed in the midst of a human rights and humanitarian crisis of historic proportion. As the government and the military of Myanmar, of Burma, expels a huge proportion of its population of Muslims in Rakhine State, the long persecuted Rohingya community. When Dan and I met with senior officials at the State Department yesterday, um, this was indeed our message to them. My question to them was the same one I, I raised a couple of moments ago. Ten years from now, if your kids are studying about the elimination of a people from Western Burma and they ask you what you did while you were in the government to prevent that disaster, what will you be prepared to say to them? Now, in recent days, we have seen some encouraging signals uh, from the administration, more than signals, and from others. Uh, in remarks to the Security Council last Wednesday, uh, Wednesday of last week, Vice President Pence referred to the savagery of the Burmese military. And he stated, and I quote, President Trump and I call on this Security Council and the United Nations to take strong and swift action to bring this crisis to an end and give hope and help to the Rohingya people in their hour of need. Yesterday, uh, Nikki Haley, U.S. Ambassador Nikki Haley, condemned, and I quote, a brutal, sustained campaign to cleanse the country of an ethnic minority. 
She added, and I quote again, the time for well-meaning diplomatic words in this council has passed. We must now consider action against Burmese security forces who are implicated and stoking hatred among their fellow citizens, end quote. Finally, she called upon the Burmese military to respect human rights, to be held accountable uh, for abuses. She urged a suspension in the provision of weapons uh, to the military by any government in the world. She urged unfettered access to Rakhine State and insisted that the government create conditions that would permit the safe return of the Rohingya. And in his remarks uh, to the Security Council, uh, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres uh, said much the same. And these are very welcome statements, notwithstanding the fact uh, that they should have been issued weeks ago. But they have to be coupled with action. A far, a far greater sense of urgency and some sense of a strategy to end this awful suffering. The president himself should address this crisis and deploy a very senior level envoy to the region. The administration should make clear it is prohibiting all military to military cooperation with Burma until abuses are ended and individuals responsible for abuses are held accountable. The administration should place targeted sanctions on senior general Min Ong Hlaung, Hlaung and, and other senior of military officials and military owned enterprises until gross violations are ended and those responsible are held to account. And the administration should press in the Security Council for targeted sanctions and a multilateral arms embargo on Burma, authorized collection of evidence on human rights violations uh, in the effort to expel the Rohingya population, and support a referral uh, to the International Criminal Court unless the authorities in Burma make substantial progress on human rights and hold accountable those responsible for these awful abuses. Most importantly, again, the administration, the Congress and countries of the world have to treat this crisis with the urgency it demands and must develop strategies to influence change. This unfolding tragedy is not only heartbreaking, it is yet another test of the willingness of the world and of, and of all of us to mobilize and take action to prevent and end these crimes against humanity uh, of enormous proportion. Thank you. Eric, thank you for those, uh, those, those powerful and, and really important remarks. Um, we're now going to hear from, uh, hear from our panelists to provide some additional context on the situation. I'll turn first to Andrea Gittleman, who is a, a researcher at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum and has been following these issues for, uh, for years, to tell us a little bit about the backdrop of how things arrived at the point they, they have in the last few months. Andrea? Well, thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for the center for holding this important conversation. Um, I'm going to speak a bit about how we got here and why we are all here. I think the, the information that Eric Schwartz just shared indicates that this is a situation that is demanding the highest of alarms. I think what is extremely frustrating about this situation, besides the sheer human cost, is that all of this was completely preventable. Uh, we all knew the likelihood of ethnic cleansing of mass atrocities in Burma, and the early warning signs all went unheeded. I spoke to people in Yangon and in Sitwe in October of 2016. So this is just before, just a few days before the first ARSA attack that then um, the, the first uh, wave of clearance operations by the military began. And I spoke with people there who were concerned about human rights violations against Rohingya, but really didn't see any risk of heightened violence in the future. They saw no risk of anything like ethnic cleansing, of crimes against humanity. They saw perhaps a worrisome human rights 
situation that was by all means stable. And that I think is really worrisome, especially knowing what has evolved since. And the idea that ingrained persecution by the state or that human rights violations can, can be some sort of stability is of course completely false. Um, we of course were worried about the risk of atrocities initiated a report years ago. What we do at the museum and with the Center for the Prevention of Genocide within the museum is to take the lessons from the Holocaust and use those lessons to inform policy decisions today. Speaking with Rohingya refugees um, over the years, um, and including in uh, around Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh in January of this year after the first round of clearance operations, the stories that people shared matched so closely the stories that come through in our museum. The stories of people fleeing for their lives. Also the stories of people risking their lives to help others. People trying to profit off of other people's misery and the story of inaction by the international community. I think we can also learn that the conditions from which atrocities arise have certain commonalities and we should be attuned to those warning signs if we're to prevent um, ethnic cleansing and other atrocities in the future. In terms of the museum, we have different streams of work. We look at places where mass atrocities are currently happening and we look at places where there might be early warning signs no mass violence now, but the raw ingredients are there to see what we can do in the name of prevention. And today I'll speak about both of those things because Burma, I think, captures um, both of those situations. So I have three key takeaways, just to give you a preview. I think it's most important to remember that the Burmese government created an enabling environment for mass atrocities through its state-led persecution. And over the course of the past several decades, the military in Burma was allowed to do pretty much whatever it wanted. It had a clear signal that business as usual could involve grave human rights viola violations against civilians. And finally, the democratic transition that is ongoing in Burma has brought some change. Yes, but of course not to Rohingya, not to the, the Rohingya population. So if we think about how the Burmese government created this enabling environment, um, it's important to remember that state-led persecution has been a constant for the Rohingya experience in Burma. Stripped of citizenship from um, a 1982 law that fed into this narrative that Rohingya are foreigners. And from there that, that they were threats to, to the rest of the country. Um, they were stripped of voting rights as well more recently. And as a side note, it's important to remember the Rohingya are not the only minority in Burma who have been so severely mistreated by the government and by the military and the Rakhine themselves have suffered abuse. They're kind of, of course being the majority in, in Rakhine state. Um, the Rohingya though were, were singled out for particular policies and particular orders that applied only to them. Um, local orders that were in fact in, uh, in certain parts of Northern Rakhine state, for example, impacted everyday aspects of human life. Um, travel, getting healthcare, uh, having a job, uh, getting married, having children and the like. And we've seen restrictions on freedom of movement that really is much more than that, that it really impedes everything that, that any person would need to do. Of course, with those kinds of policies and those kinds of restrictions, people can pay money in order to avoid those kinds of restrictions. But this population was kept so purposely poor that the restrictions were, were all the more damaging. And these policies then kind of led to this greater exclusion and demonization of the Rohingya, so they're seen as outsiders and more and more as threats, and these laws and policies really help back up that narrative. And in general, just speaking um, about the, the theory of why atrocities happen, having that kind of exclusionary ideology and a history of persecution and violence, those are red flags for future atrocities. And that's, that's no, that should not be surprising. So moving on to the actions of the, the Burmese military, military violence in Burma has looked similar to what we're seeing now in other places and, and in, uh, uh, in other times. The military, of course, has kept a great role in Burma's uh, government. Even during its democratic transition, the military wrote the constitution, the 2008 constitution, and has kept 25% of seats in parliament for itself. And of course, you would need more than 75% to change the constitution, so by doing so, they effectively kept one foot inside the door. Um, provisions also allow for a, a military takeover, so to speak, um, within the Constitution. 
So I think it's important to remember that soldiers have been acting this way against civilians for quite some time. They're doing it not because they don't know that it's wrong, but they're doing it because they know that they can get away with it. And what's odd now, and I think is particularly disturbing, is that there's some reports that there's no growing support for the military in Burma, which is, is really frightening when you think about the, the violence and, and the, the brutality that the military regime exacted on the Burmese population for so long. This is a population that has survived so much. And finally, just thinking about the democratic transition, we spoke with people in, in Sitwe and in Yangon um, over the past couple of years. People had a lot of hope that the democratic transition would improve the situation for minorities in the country and specifically for Rohingya. And of course, that hasn't happened. And I think, as is probably obvious to many of you, that democracies and rights respecting policies don't necessarily go hand in hand and that you really need to have strong leadership making sure that um, any kind of democracy will take into account the, the rights of a minority population. So I think there are some worrisome signs in the future. I think there's a long road to go, not only to address the immediate humanitarian concerns that I'll let my colleagues speak about more, but about building that long road forward, trying to rebuild trust between people who will need to live together in the future. Yep. Andrea, thank you very much. Uh, we'll turn now to Sarah Margon, who's the Washington Director for Human Rights Watch. Uh, Human Rights Watch has been doing really seminal research, documenting what's happening now. And so, Sarah, could you tell us a little bit about what you guys yeah, are finding? Sure. Thanks. Thanks for hosting this panel. I feel like I've been working on this issue since August 25th, pretty much day in, day out. And I cover the world in my work. So you can you can understand sort of the prominence and level at which we are we are dealing. In fact, our whole organization is sort of attuned to what's happening and focused on it. So just very briefly, I think it's important, and you did some, you made some great comments about sort of the overarching context in which <clears throat> this most recent operation has happened. Uh, the Burmese military campaign against the Rohingya population started on August 25th in response to attacks by the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army, or ARSA, and they attacked 30 or so, 25 or 30 military uh, uh, army base and police posts. And part of the reason I think it's important to note that is because there, there is an increased level of violence among certain elements of the Rohingya. And because of the state-led persecution against this population, you might not be surprised to know that. They have nowhere else to turn. We are concerned and watching closely with how much this grows and where it's going and what the structure of this group is, whether it's sort of a ragtag bunch of individuals or it's actually more formally coordinated. But regardless, the military's heavy-handed and brutal response has included an extensive burning of homes and villages, arson, killings, massacres, sexual violence. I mean, it's, it is so gruesome. My colleagues who are there have sent back notes. They're now in Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh, where Eric was. And I think it, what they have sent back is so astounding. One of our researchers there was a, uh, a two-tour Marine sniper in Iraq. And his level, part of the reason he's joined the organization is because he never wanted to see what he saw in Iraq again. And he has said he has never in his life seen anything like this. Um, so uh, as Eric mentioned, there's been over 500,000 Rohingya who have fled, joining, I, I think, almost another 500,000 who fled previously in 2012 and 2016 during the last um, last clearing operations by the Burmese military. Um, there's also about 20,000 internally displaced people in Rakhine State. Most of them are Rohingya, but not exclusively. I think it's important to note that from our understanding, the Burmese military has also been working with local proxy militias, mostly Rakhine people, villagers, that they have basically endorsed and supported. And one of the things we're also trying to find out is how closely are they working together? Are they strategizing for attacks? Are they sharing weaponry? What does the, the plan of operation look like in terms of who's commanding what? And that's been very important, although difficult to find out. So shortly after the first round of attacks uh, came out, we couldn't get into Rakhine State like everybody else. And so we, we pulled satellite imagery. Um, and what, this is what you're seeing behind maybe better not to look behind me since I'm, we're all sitting in front of it, but you can see it on the other screens. But really what we've done is we've sort of pulled together over the last month images 
And I think it's important to note that in 2012 and 2016, particularly in 2016, we looked at this, we looked at that clearing operation, and we actually did find that also to be crimes against humanity. So this is not the first time we have called the Burmese military out for that. And as Andrea noted, they have a long history of going after a number of ethnic groups with similar tactics and abusive um, operations. But what we've seen this time around is the overall area of mass arson and burning is found to be spread along a 100 kilometer stretch of Rakhine State. That is significantly longer than the last time around in 2016, which was only 20 kilometers. So I'm, we have out in front sort of more detailed breakdown of this, that what we're calling an atlas of our images. And I've just put a few up here so you don't all fall asleep looking at a PowerPoint presentation. But the red villages, the red marks on this map, are the villages that have been basically burned to the ground. It's a scorched earth effort. You may, have, you may remember, if you've been doing work like this for a long time, in 20, 2005 in Darfur, there were very clear scorched earth tax, tactics to displace people from their homes and villages. That's very similar to what we're, here, to what we're seeing here. And from what we can tell so far, these are all Rohingya villages. So at this point, we have near total destruction of 288 villages with 90% of the structures in those villages damaged. Uh, I want to go a little closer. If you look um, at, at this one, what you can really see, these are really the three main townships. Mangda Township is the one close to the border. You can see the border between Burma and Bangladesh, and it's the Naf River that runs between them where everybody where many people have been crossing. And you can see sort of down south where, where the, in number 10 squares, you can see all the red. That's really, Mangdaw Township has been really decimated from what we can tell. The, and as it goes up as well, you can also see what's particularly interesting is that where it says sort of 9 and 12, those are separate images we have out front if you want to take that back review that gets into more depth of the village names. But those are separated by a mountain range. So it's not like they just sort of got lazy and moved over to the right and got a little less active. But in fact, there was a clear systematic attempt to go after the population, regardless of which side of the mountain that they were on. Um, this is, uh, I think this is from, this is September 22nd. And I, you actually mentioned that you called this Crimes Against Humanity on September 5th. And I wanted to note that that was not only earlier than the U.S. government, but it was the same day that Aung San Suu Kyi gave her, uh, gave her speech and said that clearing operations were no longer happening, that they had ceased. And in fact, this image, of, you can see the fire from the sky, you can see the smoke, is from September 22nd. Now, it's true it may not have been lit that day, but it's the monsoon season. It's raining, as you saw Eric standing in the rain. It's hard for fire to stay unless it's significant, it's widespread and systematic, and it's been recently lit. And I think that's a tremendously important point that runs totally contrary to what Aung San Suu Kyi said about the end of the operations. This is um, a complete destruction of a Rohingya village. Um, you can see uh, this is Mangda Township, and you can see how destroyed it is. I mean, literally, it just it looks completely burned to the ground. Um, these are different villages. Down here on the right uh, is a Rakhine village, the one that's in the yellow box. That's a Rakhine village. That is not a Muslim Rohingya village. That's standing. The one right next to it is. So you can see the difference. And from what it appears, there was a selection taking place. We're still working to clarify that. As you might imagine, the authorities... Um, in Rangoon are not particularly forthcoming with this kind of information. In fact, they've been pretty, um, they've been pretty much moving in, in the other direction with some of the statements they've made, which I'll, I'll mention in a minute. Um, and then this is the last slide I wanted to show you. This is across the border in Bangladesh. The first slide is from May 25th. That is the mountains of Bangladesh. The one below it is September 22nd. That is the population and the camp that has sprung up since the beginning of this operation. So you not only have, um, you have burned villages and destroyed um, livelihoods in Rakhine, but now you have a total changing of the landscape and an incredibly cramped situation in, across the border in Bangladesh, which I know Jason will talk about the humanitarian impacts of that. 
Um, but that is, to me, that looks like a micro city, or you know, that is so stark to see what uh, how quickly that population grouping has sprung up in a place where there formerly um, was nothing. Where there was basically you know small villages, but that's it. Um, so uh, along with all of this satellite imagery, we also got uh, two colleagues across the border in Bangladesh doing research. And at the same time, we've been tracking what the military and even the civilian government have been saying in response to these allegations that we and other organizations have put out about what's happening. And I, I just want to be very clear uh, to underscore your point about sort of the ongoing persecution and um, ethnic uh, differences, the othering that has really been created with the Rohingya population. On September 16th, the Burmese army commander that Eric mentioned, Ming Ong Lang, linked the Rohingya demands to be recognized as an ethnic group under Burmese law with the armor operations. He uses the term Bengali, which is not a nice term. It's a racist term. It's an ethnic slur. And that's how he continues to call the Rohingya people. He said, and I quote, they have demanded recognition as Rohingya, which has never been an ethnic group in Myanmar. The Bengali issue is a national clause, and we need to be united in establishing the truth. He also described the ongoing operations against the Rohingya as unfinished business dating to the end of World War II, 1942, when there was a mass slaughter of the Rohingya populations. At the same time, Aung San Suu Kyi's office, which of course is not directly um, directly undertaking and commanding the operations has basically blamed the Rohingya population for the current situation. And at one point, her office said that everybody who fled to Bangladesh was responsible for the atrocities and the attacks against the army posts and the police. So this, all of this collectively is how we've been able to determine that this is crimes against humanity. Um, which I won't go into in any more detail. I think you did a really good job of sort of placing it within the context of crimes committed against a certain population. Um, but what we've seen is so, so incredibly brutal. I, 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 can't, I can't underscore that enough. And so I think Eric did a very good job of focusing on the need for urgent response. And we are starting to see the wheels of government move, this government, other governments. I was in France earlier this week, and the Parisians have taken this up. President Macron has decided that this is going to be an issue that he focuses on. They have the pen. Uh, they're the president of the UN Security Council starting on Sunday for the month of October. And they intend working with the British to move forward on this. The U.S., based on Ambassador Haley's very good comments, I think will be a partner. And for me, this is an important opportunity for the U.S. to actually prove that they can engage on human rights, despite a president who appears to be walking the U.S. back from its longstanding um, place in promoting um, human rights and advancing values as a part of American foreign policy. So there's an opportunity here that to reverse course and actually engage proactively to protect, support, and bring justice to this population, which has been completely denied that for basically its whole existence. But I also think it's important, as Andrea noted, to flag that this is not just a problem for the Rohingya people in Burma. There are so many other populations. When I was in Burma two years ago, I went up to Shan State on the border with China and saw the military doing the same thing. So when the US repealed sanctions in October 2016, the previous administration, they were doing so to basically say, look, we know this democratic transition is happening and we want to support you. In our perspective, they removed those targeted sanctions too early. There hadn't been enough movement on the transition to actually merit the lifting of the sanctions. And it was not just because of the Rohingya. It was because the military had not transitioned to civilian leadership. It was because they hadn't let go of their 25% in Congress, because they were still abusive and brutal, and because there had been no accountability for anything that had be done, been done. These are tried and true tactics. And so like Refugees International, one of the things that we're pushing for, again, is the reapplication or reimposition of targeted sanctions on senior military officials and on those entities that bring them a large portion of their revenue. We are actually very much aligned in what our calls are, and I think they're all appropriate in focusing right now on the military. This is not to say that Aung San Suu Kyi and the civilian leadership is blameless. Um, there's been a lot of conversation, as you've all seen, about taking away her, her, her um, Nobel Peace Prize, which literally cannot happen. Um, once you got it, you got it. Um, but she has really, I think, fallen from grace in terms of being the leader we had all hoped that she could be to move the country towards legitimate 
um, democracy. So now the task falls on other governments and multilateral institutions to do what needs to get done to not only stop the active uh, operations, to provide aid for these people, and to ensure that there's some measure of justice and accountability. And if that they and if they do return back to Burma, which frankly is a big question, that they do sh do so with freedom of movement and dignity, and that ultimately they can become the citizens that they have been denied. Um, access to. So I think I'll stop there. I'm happy in the Q&A to talk more about the details of U.S. government actions on this, but thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Jason, this is, this is one of the largest and most rapid uh, movements of population that we've seen since the, um, the expulsion of Albanians from Kosovo in the late 1990s. Um, significantly quicker even, and that's posing real challenges for humanitarian response. Uh, MSF has been there from the beginning working, working in these, um, calling them camps, maybe even too, too grandiose a term, but these settlements where people have, have fled to. Tell us a little bit about what's going on there and what the humanitarian needs look like at this point. Thanks. Um, yeah, we've worked in, in, in Rakhine since 1994, and we've worked in Cox's Bazaar since 1992. Uh, the Rohingya issue is, has been central uh, to my organization for, for many decades, and I myself have also worked in Kutupalong for over a year, uh, several years ago, so it's also deeply personal for me. Uh, 500,000 people, it's almost the population of Washington, D.C., that have packed up and are living in a jungle. Um, there's, there's nothing. There's, there's just the first inklings of a humanitarian response. Um, you know, People are basically, we see them as we try to access this new mega camp, which you saw pictures of. There's no real roads. It's just people strewn in the, in the hills and in the jungle and trying to chop down some trees and hang a tarp if they're lucky enough to have been given a tarp already. Um, of the 500,000 people so far, maybe 200,000 people, family units, have received like a tarp, a bucket, $25. Um, other people are starting to receive some food rations. Uh, however, you know, it's mostly just rice at this point, which is not a nutritious meal. Um, just to give you some clarity, I mean, the unregistered Rohingya living in Bangladesh, before the 500,000 people came across the border in the last four weeks, already were food insecure. There already were emergency levels of malnutrition in this population. Um, in, in the Kudapalong camp, the, the severe acute malnutrition rate was 4.8% prior to the influx and the global rate was 20%. These are already emergency thresholds, well above. Uh, with the level of food insecurity that we see now, we expect that to rise. Um, people in the hills there, you know, it's the rainy season, it's muddy. I mean, it's, I mean there's feces uh, intertwined with the mud, and they're basically living and, and sleeping and, and begging and looking for handouts wherever they can get them um, in just the most abhorrent conditions that you can possibly imagine. Um, this is a five-alarm humanitarian crisis of the first degree. It's historic. Uh, we're desperately scaling up. We went from having, I think, uh, an ongoing project there of seven international staff and a couple hundred uh, local staff, and I think at this point we, we have well over 50 international staff, and I, I, I imagine that there's dozens of, of local staff being hired on a daily basis, uh, and other organizations are doing this. Um, but, you know, if you weren't present in Cox's Bazaar before, it's very hard to go and start programs, and, and these people can't wait. Um, so we're really at a, at a critical juncture right now where this population is a humanitarian emergency and crisis of the first degree, but it, it could become a catastrophe very easily. I mean, the risk of communicable disease right now is, is, is I don't think it can be higher. Um, I know that people have been started to be vaccinated for measles and there's discussions about doing a preventative um, cholera vaccination because uh, it is uh, endemic to the area, very high risk. Um, so incredibly scary situation from a humanitarian perspective. There's, there's the real, real chance of a significant loss of life due to the inability of us as a humanitarian community um, to scale up effectively and fast enough because half a million people in four weeks, I mean, this is, you really have to go back in history to draw some parallels. Um, and then in those conditions, 
So in the first three weeks um, after the August 25th, uh, you know, we, we treated a lot of people who were the victims of violence. Uh, we treated at least 159 gunshot wounds. A lot of those wounds were in the back. Um, children, women. Uh, we've treated scores of, of women for sexual violence. Um, we've seen blast wounds. We've seen burns. Um, we, we've definitely treated a lot of patients that would indicate indiscriminate violence. Um, we've, we've treated over 10,000 people for uh, various afflictions. Right now, one of the, the biggest one is acute watery diarrhea. We're seeing a lot of adults also coming in uh, with dehydration and acute watery diarrhea, which is very rare. It's not normal to, for so many adults to be dehydrated. It means they don't have access to water. Uh, we know for a fact that a lot of these people are drinking paddy water from the rice fields, from puddles, from shallow hand-dug wells. And some places in this area you can dig like, you know, four or five yards down and you'll get some, some dirty water, but this is, you know, in these conditions becomes contaminated so quickly. Uh, it's, it's absolutely terrifying. Uh, so, you know, also this mega camp, I mean, this is the most densely populated, one of the most densely populated countries in the world, struggling also with, a, with climate change and a, and a very low-lying land. Land politics in Bangladesh are extremely contentious. And, you know, the fact that uh, the government of Bangladesh has let in 500,000 people in the last four weeks, I think, is something that we should also um, congratulate them on, on keeping the border open and, and see what uh, pressure we can put on our governments to provide assistance. Um, I know for a fact that the United States has not set a very good moral tone on that with an announcement this week that we're going to limit the number of refugees coming to this country to 45,000. So also, I mean, we've, as an organization, um, think that maybe they should open up some space in the registered refugee camps. Maybe the one thing we can ask in, on the Hill is that they add 20,000 Rohingya to the tally here in the United States and set a moral example for a change. Um, why not? So anyway, that's the situation in Bangladesh. It is, it's terrifying from a humanitarian perspective. My colleagues right now are working around the clock. It's extremely difficult and urgently, urgently needs to be scaled up. The situation in Rakhine, where we're also present, is equally frightening because we don't know what's happening. We are not allowed to see uh, any of our patients in northern Rakhine. We've, we've been completely blocked since August 25th, uh, and we're very much are demanding access to our patients. Uh, in central Rakhine, we have limited access that isn't meaningful. We're not allowed to go where we want, not allowed to have international oversight, and this is a very important thing that going forward, the, the humanitarian response in Rakhine has international oversight because without that, there is no transparency to what's happening. When you take the, like I, you, you expressed the, the level of, of intercommunal tensions just prior to August 25th when this blew up, you know, this was a poisonous environment to begin with. Um, it's very important in this situation that that there is some transparency so that the world can understand what has happened. Uh, and also importantly, who is getting assistance and is that assistance effective? Uh, because a lot of these communities, there's a camp with 120,000 people in it from the previous uh, round in, in Rakhine who were completely dependent upon assistance and we've had no meaningful access to that camp uh, since August 25th. Uh, and we also very much ask that the population in northern Rakhine not be put into segregated camps because that is not going to solve the problem either. Uh, making people completely dependent on assistance is, is one of the worst things that you can do for them. Uh, and we definitely are looking to see our patients again and hopefully soon. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. So I'm going to, I'm going to pose one or two questions to the panel here and then we will open it up for a Q&A with the audience. Um, I, there was a BBC, uh, a BBC expose piece that came out this morning that has uh, accused the UN in, in, uh, in Burma of ignoring the run-up to this and of uh, at times consciously sweeping any evidence 
of looming atrocities under the rug, uh, really averting its gaze. That, that's, in, that's in contrast, I think, to what we've seen from the Secretary General in recent days. But I'm curious for, the, for all of your thoughts on the UN's handling of this to date, both at a, at a, at a, a ground level there in Burma, what, what could they or should they have done better? And at a global level, what should the Security Council be doing now? Um, and uh, also intrigued by uh, some of what, what uh, Jason talked about, about the strains that this, uh, that this population and this sudden influx puts on Bangladesh. What should the world be doing to better support Bangladesh to, um, to manage this? Whoever would like to go first. Well, I mean, from my perspective, the Bangladesh needs, uh, it needs to be acknowledged for, for allowing 500,000 people in in the last four weeks. Uh, but also the, the, the constraints that puts on Bangladesh as a country, politically, domestically, uh, are significant and, and they need support. And, you know, there's no shortage of, of international institutions that can provide funding assistance, uh, organizations that can scale up the response. Um, we should encourage our, our lawmakers to increase funding uh, here in the U.S. and, you know, broadly across the political spectrum. Uh, countries to to talk with them and ask them what they need um, and how to to make this situation uh, tenable because I don't see them going back to to Rakhine anytime soon just a, a couple of thoughts I mean I think the US the UN put out an appeal for 77 million dollars I think for aid which maybe I've spent too long working on Iraq and Afghanistan but when I saw the number I thought my god that's like a drop in the bucket given the numbers of people and the US actually stepped up remarkably quickly I think they offered 35 million 32 million, 32 million. last week that's a good start I mean that's basically half of the appeal so I think that's a good you know that might help for the next few months but getting that out the door getting that to where it needs to go so it's actually reaching a population is obviously going to be huge and I think making sure that the aid um, effort in Bangladesh is run by the UN in a coordinated way. I mean, I'm not an aid expert, but that seems to be a real primary piece in conjunction with the Bangladeshis who have been um, who have been at the forefront. I think making sure that it's not necessarily the Bangladeshi army that is in charge of those camps and that the the refugees um, have freedom of movement is going to be tremendously important. My understanding is that the army has started to descend on some of those camps or settlements, and that, that has the potential to be very worrisome. Mm -hmm. In terms of the UN within Burma, very briefly, I mean, I think it's a very difficult situation, and the UN is there at the request of the Burmese. But at, at the same time, you know, there's been a real struggle over a number of years to get a human rights office into Burma. There was an MOU signed. Um, but the office has never really been realized and never actually gotten off the ground. Um, you know, and questions over development and political progress at the expense of human rights, it's a similar debate to what you see in foreign aid debates here, right? I mean, you, you can only do development and, and make progress on that at, uh, to a certain point if you're not including human rights and the rule of law and addressing some of these underlying issues, you're not, you're not actually going to get to a genuinely pluralistic society. So there's some gaps there, and the UN has had some experiences in handling this uh, poorly before, and there have, there's something called the human rights up front mechanism, which the UN needs to really be putting these human rights up front. And so, you know, I think the new Secretary General has been out in front, but there needs to be a look at actually what did happen uh, in Burma. And then finally, very quickly in terms of the Security Council, so they had, um, they had a, pr a public meeting yesterday, uh, which is a good first start. The French have apparently committed to have an ARIA briefing, which means that you'll get some well uh, knowledgeable briefers there. But they need to pull something together a little bit more substantial, and they need to do it quickly. Uh, our recommendation is for a UN Security Council resolution that includes a multilateral arms embargo, like Eric mentioned, and targeted sanctions. The likelihood of that passing, it's going to be a slog. You've got China and Russia who are not going to want to see that move. Um, but I think the, the, if the U.S., the French, and the U.K. work together, they can start to move the ball forward. And if they can't get something passed at that level that would require all U.N. member states to engage, then they can start to build up that bilateral effort. There's no reason the UN can't impose, the U.S. can't impose bilateral sanctions while a U.N. Security Council resolution is moving. Other governments can do the same. 
So it starts to create both an understanding and a need to engage. And if you can't do it through the UN Security Council, then bilateral um, efforts need to be made as well. Mm. Um, Andrea, I think you had... Oh, come. sorry. I was just going to add briefly um, that there are echoes of Sri Lanka and what we're seeing now. And so Human Rights Upfront came out of the, the after action that they looked at what went so horribly wrong. And I think when we look at the UN Resident Coordinator in, in Burma and in Myanmar, that the, to be generous, I feel like perhaps trying to support the government, not just the UN office, but other governments around the world had done, perhaps it was with the aim that by supporting elected leaders that perhaps they on their own would then improve the situation or that um, you know, early warning signs would organically improve if a political situation were to change. Um, this, of course, is, is not the case. And I think a real lesson going forward, which sadly had to be learned, is that these early warning signs need to be addressed head on. And military leadership is still primarily responsible, even if you have a civilian-led government, that military has still been allowed to, to run amok. Um, so just supporting one side of the government still isn't enough to really protect civilians. Just beware of the phrase, it's complicated. Um, you know, uh, and um, lots of things are complicated. But, you know, in, in, the, in the world of policy, that is code for, um, you know, that is code for these human rights concerns. We understand them, but this is complicated. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there are shades of gray. And, you, you know, and, and we have to temper our outrage if we really want to make progress. When you start to hear that, just get very nervous <laughs> um, um, because... Uh, the you know uh, the only thing an international institution like the United Nations has is its integrity, its consistency of character. It's and and so so even in circumstances where you're trying to get access, get along with governments, um, you have to sustain your fundamental values and articulate them. And this is a this reflects you know a, a long debate discussion, tension between the human rights world, which is a world that is composed of shoulds and norms, and the world of humanitarian assistance, uh, which uh, humanitarian aid providers often um, uh, have to have cooperation with governments to work with governments. But the imperative of getting in and having cooperation with governments should never cause any organization you know, to, um, to mute its concerns about critical issues. The establishment of MSF is all about that issue. Um, and, and, and so humanitarian actors um, have to, and, and those who are involved in the development process, have to continually articulate these critically important human rights principles. Um, because if you don't, as we didn't in the case of Burma, the U.S. government didn't um, always, and the, and the U.N. organizations didn't, you send signals uh, about what you may be prepared to tolerate. You encourage impunity. And in my own view, um, you, you set the stage for the kind of thing that we've seen over the past many weeks. So, you know, and, and so that means when we think about the international response, Let's just not, let's not think about, you know, how does it work operationally? Let's also think about the responsibility of international organizations to articulate the rights that these, that these uh, victims have. Um, an organization like UNHCR is a rights-based organization. And, um, and, and those kinds of principles have to be articulated continually in the process. And as, and as I'm all for you know, I think the Bangladesh government made the critical decision here. Either they were going to push against this or they were going to say, you know, we'll take this on. And they made the right decision. And they're on the right side of history. And that's a great thing. And they deserve all the compliments that they've gotten. But that doesn't mean that, they're, that they are not, that they shouldn't be subject to scrutiny in terms of whether or not they are permitting uh, uh, free movement of, of refugees, whether they are you know, you know, recognizing the rights of these communities. And I think if, if we forget that, 
then we have these kinds of incidents. I, I, I agree with you, and, and, and the international community is a broad place, and, and Bangladesh could also recognize the 500,000 refugees and give yeah. them the, the rights of refugees, which uh, at the moment I think there's only 70,000 recognized refugees in, in Bangladesh. And, and when, I, when I worked there, we worked in the makeshift camp with the unrecognized refugees, which was a slum that surrounded the, the Shangri-La of the UNHCR camp. Yep. And it, it, was, it was shocking, uh, even then, the level of, of violence, uh, the quiet violence of uh, extreme poverty, of uh, people trafficked. I, I remember talking to a woman who, you know, her aspiration was to be able to save enough for a bribe to work in a sweatshop. You know, that's your dream. I mean, and I, and I, Can you so explain what the difference is between what some are recognized and not recognized? Well, if you're recognized under, uh, as a refugee, you have certain legal rights. Right. No, I know that, but I mean the Bangladesh government is uh, how arbitrarily or is there a process that these people go through to be recognized? Or? They would have to be officially registered as refugees with the government and UNHCR. And at present, that, that no new refugees are being registered. We'll take we'll take questions oh, okay. but, very shortly. But, we'll, we'll send Mike. But, to, but also to, to come back to your point about you know it is historic and 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 we do see uh, you know what we're seeing is is a targeted campaign against the Rohingya for sure. Um, but there's room to have rights-based discussions and policy circles. And then there's also the people who are the firemen who are rushing into the fire. That's right. And mm -hmm. and. You know, for us right now, it's a five alarm fire. There's a couple of fire trucks on the scene. We're rushing in and trying to save lives. So at this point for us, it's not a discussion about how the fire got set or, or what we need to do to put it out. We're, we're really just trying to get as many people out of there as possible right now uh, and then have a discussion later on when, when the fire is not raging as we speak. I, I could not agree more, I, 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 but I was just responding to the question mm. uh, that was asked. Um, but no, you're absolutely right. The imperative now is, is to save lives. Yeah. And my reference uh, to MSF was, you know, Bernard Kushner, correct me if my history is wrong, but Bernard Kushner was just very upset about the fact that um, some of the international humanitarian organizations that operated confidentially were, were compromised in their unwilling because of their unwillingness to really speak out when the humanitarian when the human rights and humanitarian situation dictated that they speak out i think that's why the organization it's an interesting thing i mean and if you look at icrc's history and and icrc is one of the only organizations actually allowed to participate in, in aid operations in yeah. rakai now though i don't know the details under what conditions those are yeah. um but no i mean we're i i understand completely but i also think that at there are times where you will, you should maybe not speak out in order to have access to populations and, and to actually treat patients. Um, and I think the world is also a little different uh, place from when Bernard was, was explaining his indignation. Um, I mean, there's been a, a huge expansion in, in, in the international um, rights-based organizations and advocacy and, and the intervention, the invention of the internet. So, so suddenly it's, it's actually everybody understands that they don't have those rights and demands them. That's right. Yeah. Which is, you know, I mean, this we've seen with the Rohingya as well. They all have cell phones, even no matter how poor you are, you still have a cell phone in, in this day and age. Yeah, no. So, so I, you know, I mean, I think that, that and that's a beautiful thing. All right, well, we will we'll open it up to questions now. There are mics. Um, we have two people with mics in the back, so just stick a hand in the air, and we'll take, I think, three at a time and then turn it over to the panel. So why don't we go, I think I saw a hand here, and then the two in the back first. Hello, my name is Megan Donahoe, and I'm with Search for Common Ground. And very often in um, ethnic-based violence, we see that um, hateful media rhetoric plays a big role. And I was wondering if you could speak to that and how it's promulgated any violence. And then we had questions in the back row as well. I'm, I'm Ed Elmendar from the UN Association. I have a double-barreled question. The first barrel is around the UN and the apparent failure of the Security Council to act effectively. I wondered if you have considered or others have considered the Uniting for Peace 
procedure under which the UN General Assembly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. seizes itself of an issue if the Security Council fails to act. The second barrel concerns the dynamics within uh, Burma. I was wondering whether anyone is addressing ways of looking at the dynamics of decision making and action within the country as a way of addressing some of these problems. Great. And one more. Uh, my name is Sahar. I'm from the Voice of America. Uh, there are 40,000 Rohingya Muslims in India. And uh, India wants them to be deported because they believe that uh, those Muslims, Rohingya Muslims, have connections with terrorist organizations in Pakistan. So the US might have the same concerns. So how do you see this decision as a human rights expert? All right, um, who would like to go first? Uh, maybe um, I can speak sure. about hate speech and some of the rhetoric mm -hmm. in the media. Um, this is something that has, has happened. So the, the media in Burma was largely state controlled for many years and with the transition we're seeing more independent outlets. What we're seeing now is even some of those independent outlets to a lesser extent, but certainly the state run media is still using inflammatory, dehumanizing uh, language towards Rohingya. Um, you've probably seen um, language about you know them being thorns that need to be removed, things like that. Um, language that is is reminiscent of past cases where we've seen ethnic cleansing or genocide, and this is something that is is quite alarming, especially in a relatively new media environment um, where there are uh, more journalists, there are more media outlets, there's increased use of of Facebook um, just in the past couple of years. There is little understanding about um, sharing news and, and kind of verifying what's what's there. This is not a, a um, problem unique to Burma, but I think it certainly inflames some of the tensions that are already there. So there are, I think there's a genuine um, uh, fear and a genuine um, hatred or dismissal of the Rohingya population. And that's only, I think, strengthened when you have large mouthpieces also sharing that that kind of rhetoric. Um, it was about 10 years ago, I was working with a Burmese organization um, and someone who was a longtime democracy activist who was jailed for his beliefs and was fighting for freedom for his country, making great sacrifices along the way. When asked about Rohingya, he said, oh no, they, they aren't us. They aren't one of us. He even pointed to his arm and said, their, their skin is too dark. They, they are not supposed to be here. And that is from someone who had fought for human rights and democracy in general. So that is very worrisome. And that kind of sentiment has been there for a long time and I think can be used in moments like this to even inflame more tensions, um, which would really make people almost um, understanding of what the military is doing to the Rohingya population. I agree with that completely. I wouldn't say that the, on the question of the UN Security Council, I'm not ready to say they've failed yet. Uh, they're just getting started. It's too slow. But they are starting to, the, 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 the wheels are turning, the governments are getting engaged. So let's not put the cart before the horse. Is that the right expression? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> let's not put the cart before the horse and say they failed because then they have, there's no pressure for them to, to, to act um, in terms of uniting for peace. If they did fail, yes, you know, I think that might be something. There's been, we've been talking a lot at Human Rights Watch about the UN General Assembly resolution that the European Union usually puts forward but has re abandoned in the last couple of years. So we've been trying to work with the EU to encourage them to do that again. But as many of you probably know, the EU can't come to a common position on much these days because it has its own t internal um, divisions on any number of things. Um, Sarah gave the answer I would have given on Uniting for Peace. Um, so you don't need to hear from me on that. But I, what I would say is that, um, you know, in, in, so I'll answer a question you didn't ask, um, which is, um, I really think this, this crisis provides a, a very interesting opportunity for the Trump administration uh, to, um, you know, take a leadership role in a situation where there is quite a number, large number of countries that have expressed really strong concerns about what is happening uh, to this population. It would also be a powerful demonstration by this administration that we care about human rights uh, of all people, whether they're Muslim, whether they're Christian, and, um, and could be a very powerful uh, you know, rebuttal to those who 
call this administration anti-Muslim. So I think there's a, I think there's a really uh, you know, a valuable opportunity here that the administration should seize. On, your, on two other questions that were, asking, that were being asked, and the advantage of getting several questions is you don't have to answer the ones you don't know the answer to. Um, uh, but uh, I was a, a commissioner on the US uh, Commission on International Religious Freedom, I guess through 2015, I think. And um, so we traveled uh, to Burma in 2014 and looked at this issue. And um, I have to say that the signs of chauvinism, of of, of what could only be called a, a Buddhist chauvinism uh, and, and sort of a, a nasty kind of nationalism uh, that um, was, was um, religiously based were, 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 were extremely disconcerting. And I, we saw things there similar to what we'd seen in Sri Lanka. And I think it, it creates an environment that permits um, the kind of of um, uh, horrible uh, human rights abuses uh, that we've seen over the past many weeks, and, and, and I think that's a, you know, that's a that, that that was a real serious concern. I know the Holocaust Museum is very, has uh, has been very uh, involved in in that issue as well. And then finally, what can you say about uh, India's position on the Rohingya? They're dead wrong. The government is dead wrong. Uh, what they're doing, I think. Um, uh, <sighs> You know, is uh, is is in conflict with democratic principles. Um, is in conflict with a commitment to human rights, and um, and I, I wish they would. Uh, I wish uh, they would have a very different approach on this issue. There's no justification uh, at this point for any government in the world uh, to be uh, you know to be <coughs> deporting uh, 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 this population, members of this population who have been who have been subjected to such awful abuses. I, I just, I'm sort of baffled by it, and I, and I think that, um, that, um, that I think India's, India's standing as a, as, a, as a country that respects human rights, that respects the democratic process, that res respects principles of international law, is being seriously compromised by its position on this Rohingya issue. Doesn't make any sense to me. Jason, anything to add? I, I would like to add to the question of the India question, and, and Okay, it's part of a broader question where there is blame by the government in Myanmar that you know, the Rohingya have been receiving assistance from, from uh, Al-Qaeda or that they're becoming terrorists and, and this falls into the, the, the India issue. And I mean, it's just so ridiculous. I mean, the, I, I spent so much time with them and you know, I've interviewed Rohingya men that had actually been in Afghanistan and worked for the Taliban. And, you know, I asked them what they did there. They, oh, I shined shoes and carried boxes. Same stuff that they do in, in Bangladesh because you're dealing with a population that's really, for generations, been so subjugated that, I mean, if you wanted to create the positions to drive a population to seek out any desperate means of alleviating their situation, you will reap what you sow. And this has been going on for 50, 60, 70 years. Um, but, you know, the idea that suddenly we have a very sophisticated network of, of Rohingya terrorists is just taking the, the, the whole concept of this war on terror and everything else to a ridiculous place, in my opinion. Can I, yes, can I just make one addition on that last point? I mean, I think the fundamental concern, it's not just dead wrong, it's discriminatory. And it's using terrorism as a justification to discriminate, which That's is unsurprisingly the same thing this administration has been doing as well. I think we have time for probably one more round of, of a few questions. So um, put a hand in the air. I, I'd seen one over here earlier. I don't know if it's, it's answered. OK, um, let's go here and here and here. I'm Gary Kleiman. I think um, the discussion we just had about India is, is very important in that it highlights the need for look at a regional response because as you know, before this crescendo, we've had boat people, hundreds of thousands going to Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and you certainly have to question uh, the integrity of uh, their response and certainly the treatment and isolation has continued. But I wanted to ask another question altogether, which is unusual in this kind of surrounding, and that um, 
I would want to focus on the, the private sector response, uh, which could apply here. Uh, here's a plug for uh, Jeremy and CGD, which just came out with a report along with the 10 Foundation about what the business and financial community can do in terms of the economic development piece, both in a commercial and policy sense uh, going forward. And I wonder whether you would have any recommendations of how it would apply with this crisis. Thanks. Um, we had one here in the front. <coughs> I think it was Eileen. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so I am affiliated with Refugees International. And my question was, we haven't mentioned her name really, or in this context, but An Sang Su Shi. And it does, a good, does it do any good to blame her or to call her out for this? And I know we mentioned her in just about the uh, Nobel Peace Prize, and that's in the, we can't do that. But it does it, it, is there any effectiveness, any po a reason to um, ask her for, to do something to step in? And then we have one here. Uh, Hi, thanks. Katie Stravellino with Save the Children. Um, one of our the asks that we've been asking of international governments and donors specifically is to indicate to Aung San Suu Kyi and the civilian authorities that they will redirect ongoing economic development support um, from the current programs to the humanitarian response. Um, and I'm just wondering in your conversations with US government officials if you think that this is something that they'd be open to. Um, and if so, how do you recommend we go about advocating for that to happen? Thank you. Thanks. Right, yeah, um, I want to answer all three of those questions because they're all great questions. Um, let me start with Aung San Suu Kyi. Um, and the, the um, well, my short answer, I lean to your question is, um, we can ask her not to be an apologist uh, for the government, um, because as an apologist for the government, um, uh, she makes it she makes it much more when she's playing that role, it makes it much more difficult to rally support against what's happening, because um, uh, um, because uh, you know she is still a very influential voice. So that's you know that's minimally. But I, I also, you know, I think it's presumptuous of us to to um, suggest that, it may be presumptuous of us to say that you have an obligation, Aung San Suu Kyi, to be a moral beacon here. Because that would, not, that would come with some risk. And it's kind of hard for us to say that. But, but, but on the question of, uh, of her limited influence, that's a different question, which is not, um, you know, and, and I think if you did, let's do a thought experiment. Um, what, when she gave that speech, instead of giving the speech she gave, if she stood up and said, you know, I'm here to address you today uh, because what has been happening over the past many weeks has been a source of profound sadness for me. Uh, you know, representatives of my own government, my military, with whom I work, you know, are responsible for ethnic cleansing and crimes against humanity. And this must end, and must end immediately and we must bring those who are, are responsible to justice. Now, <laughs> that would have shaken things up, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and that would have created, you know, now, now, as I said before, it would be presumptuous for me to say that Aung San Suu Kyi should have taken the decision to play that role because that would have come with considerable personal risk. But whether or not she was gonna play that role, I just, it's very disappointing to see that that she has uh, made statements that effectively have made her an apologist uh, for the government. When she said that, the, uh, that there is not uh, discrimination in Rakhine uh, in provision of health care, education, when she, when she professed ignorance about what's actually happening, when there was such an abundance of information, credible reports of massive human rights violations, so that kind of thing, I think, was, is legitimately troubling. And even if we're not going to take, even if we're not going to be so presumptuous as, as to tell Aung San Suu Kyi, you know, how strong a moral position she should play, I think the statements she made, she made were damaging. And you have to recognize that. Um, two other uh, uh, comments. Yes, I think you should talk to people at the State Department, PRM, because they're the ones who made the $32 million 
contribution and the folks, I'm sure, I'm sure Dacha, the, 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 uh, the bureau for, um, that, that, that Jeremy, you didn't run the bureau, but you ran OFDA. Um, I think you should engage them because I think they'd be interested in that conversation. Um, and on the business question, um, you know, when we think about business engagement, um, we think about in terms of, um, you know, longer term uh, development uh, support and partnerships. And who knows, in Bangladesh, uh, that may become relevant in terms of uh, providing opportunities for uh, uh, refugees who are going to be there for longer periods of time. And that may be uh, a, an opportunity for engagement in the business community. But in turn, on a, across the border in Rakhine State, um, you know, this is the most difficult time to talk about it could, you know, positive engagement from the business community. That, that, that is a question for much longer, I think, you know, much further down the road. But the issue for the business community in Rakhine right now, I think, is, you know, uh, is the corporate social responsibility issues. You know, um, or, you know what, what is your level of engagement in Western Burma? Um, and when um, uh, there are proposals, for example, to sanction um, um, uh, um, the, the, the military or the government, um, what posture does your, does your, does your you know, business take on that issue? And there I think there are important ethical and, and, uh, and uh, issues relating to corporate social responsibility that the business community will, will, will have to grapple with. Um, I would just, oh sorry, no. Um, I would just add um, two things. One on the economic, economic development versus humanitarian assistance. Um, the conversations that I had before the first round of clearance operations in Yangon and in Sitwe, people were tired of talking about humanitarian assistance. Um, people had been displaced in the camps around Sitwe since 2012. There was this idea that we should move off from it. And I know economic development, that's like the, the new thing that we should focus on. And it shows how, how much the situation is improving, where really that belies the, the facts on the ground. And it should go without saying that if you have a situation that's like this, it's so slanted where Rohingya people were so excluded from um, the benefits that economic development would bring, when you just increase that kind of development, you still have those inequalities. Um, and then just speaking briefly about Aung San Suu Kyi, I think if we take a step back and ask ourselves why, why we lead and why people um, choose to be politicians and, and run for office, and once in place, is it because we want to do everything we can to stay in power or because we have a vision of what our country could be? And I think it's people have been talking about how she doesn't have control over the military. Of course, that's true. Um, and that she needs to maintain some kind of relationship with them so that they don't, um, that they don't take control. But when you have a situation like that, it just shows that the military is already in charge. It has been in charge in Northern Rakhine State for, for some time now. Um, so really, what is that power balance like? And, and she uh, seems to be, to be falling into that. Just to, I want to. I want to, so on the Aung San Suu Kyi question, I think Eric's right. It's incredibly disappointing. But there have been two national commissions to look at the Rakhine slash Rohingya issue. The most recent of which was released about two weeks before these latest clearing operations began. It was a total whitewash, um, a complete whitewash on what had happened previously with the Rohingya population. And the comments out of her office just enabled and endorsed that um, commission completely. And so there isn't, there isn't any history here to supporting a transition, despite comments, you know, when she became um, state councilor that we would move towards giving them the Rohingya people citizenship and take another look at the 1982 law. But the other thing is that there are two other opportunities where she could have actually played a leadership role. One was endorsing and really working to implement the recommendations of the Kofi Annan Commission, which was an independent commission that looked not only at Rohingya, but other issues related to human rights and the rule of law in Burma. But then also the block on the UN fact-finding mission, which was excuse me, authorized by the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva a year ago. They have been utterly blocked from entering the, con the country, and they're supposed to go to Rakhine. This was before what <laughs> these clearing operations began. Now, it may not be up to her, but if they can't get into the country, there, is o there are always ways to engage them. So if the military blocked her from trying to bring them into the country, the head of that fact-finding commission, his face is actually at all of the visa desks when you get to Rangoon as do not let this man into the country. So 
Um, so that's Marzuki from Indonesia. Like literally he's blocked from coming into the country. So if the military wouldn't let her proceed, she could have worked other ways to help them get the information and access uh, at least to individuals that they needed, invited them to Rangoon and sat down with them. And she has done nothing to champion that fact-finding mission, which is about to have its mandate renewed in Geneva uh, by, t by the end of today. So there really, there really is a gap there in leadership and an understanding that political pluralism is not just about a small group or a, a, an ostensible majority, but is about including the most vulnerable in, in the will and leadership. On the, and just quickly on the business point, I mean, I think there are not so many American businesses that have entered Burma just yet to be able to engage. The sanctions were really only lifted a year ago, and there are certainly child labor and other sort of labor regulations that many U.S. companies going into Burma would have had to deal with long before they had to even think about what's happening in Rakhine. But I do think what's interesting is to consider the role of the Chinese, which obviously plays a huge role in the gem and minerals um, sector which is not immediately engaged or uh, by this issue, but does, as I understand it, have some entities in Rakhine State. And we have seen the Chinese, in the case of Sudan, become a relatively helpful, I say that sort of lightly, but helpful actor because stability impacts their bottom line. And so down the road, yes, and I think everything Eric has pointed out about sort of corporate social responsibility is important. In the near term, the impact on the Chinese and their ability to, 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 to make money when there is this type of uh, conflict going on uh, is going to be an important way to engage the Chinese. Certainly instability, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity is not going to be good for their bottom line. Jason, you have final word. I think regional engagement, ASEAN, has actually taken on quite a, a leadership role in the Rohingya crisis uh, years ago that they didn't use the word, and it now actually appears in their minutes, and this is huge progress. Um, and, and they'll play a very important role along with China and everyone else, but you know, these political discussions, the discussion about how the, the business community can somehow fix the long-term discussion, the development side, you know, these are all discussions that, that need to happen, and, and they should be happening, and they're very encouraging. Um, but you know, from our perspective, like right now, there are literally a half a million people who are thirsty, they're hungry, they're sick, and they're not getting enough help right now. So everything else that we're talking about, for me, is secondary to that. And also, we don't know how many more are coming, and, and ultimately how many come across the border into Bangladesh will ultimately tell us what the ultimate situation will be in Rakhine. Thanks, Jason. That's a great note to end on. Please join me in thanking this excellent panel.